If you are a fan of softball, you are going to love the Fast Pitch TV show. From SoftballJunk.com, we're bringing you more softball than anyone on the planet. Sit back and get ready. Here's the Fast Pitch TV show. Hello, I'm Gary Leland, and this is the Fast Pitch TV show. Make sure and take a look at all my videos, all my blogs, and all my softball information on my website at www.fastpitch.tv. The Fast Pitch TV website brings you more free softball information than anyone else on the planet. Now today I'm going to bring you another episode in the history of softball. I'm working with Fast Pitch softball legend and Olympian Dr. Dot Richardson and Allison Strange of PFX Athletics to film a series of interviews between Dot Richardson and other softball legends. Now you're going to be amazed at some of the softball uh, greats that are joining us on this series of shows. Now in this episode, Dot Richardson interviews Hall of Fame legend Margie Wright. Now this is the first of three interviews with Margie. Let's go to the show right after this short message. Oops, sorry, I was reading this month's issue of the Fast Pitch Magazine. What? You're not familiar with the Fast Pitch Magazine? Watch this, you are going to love it. Looks great, right? Want to find more about the number one coaching tool on the internet? Go to FastPitchMagazine.com today. History in the sport of softball begins with this young lady right here. Let me tell you. You talk about legends in the game. We're here with Margie Wright. She is truly a legend, and we're going to get with that um, a little bit later. But right now, what would be really fun, Margie, is to talk about while we're here in the ASA Hall of Fame <laughs> about some Hall of Famers that you've you know, bring back some memories and do you want to talk about? Um, it's going to be fun. That'd be great. So as we walk around this, this hall, you tell me, someone who sticks out to you and let's start talking about them. Okay. Well, I can see right here, the first one, Kay Rich, was around for many, many years, played for the Fresno Rockets, and of course that's where I used to coach. She was in our booster club. I mean, she came to all of our games, a tremendous athlete. And nobody really knows about her because, you know, they were – that was a, a tremendous team back in the 50s, and she was a great player and loves the game and stays with it, and she's in so many Hall of Fames, I don't even know. Well, this is why you're here when you said nobody knows about her. Yeah. That's how we're doing these memories and history in the yeah. sport of softball. The memories are so many, and myself, I'm just thinking about them as I'm yeah. surrounded by these greats, yeah. and particularly you. So let's yeah. keep walking. Okay. There's one over here, Bertha Tiki. What do you know about uh, her? Well, Bertha Tiki was, I think, un I mean, arguably one of the best pitchers ever. And she was a part of our booster club at Fresno State as well because she's from Central Valley in California. And my story about Bertha, because she was a pitcher, you know, before I, way before I started playing, but she um, invited me when they named the high school field after her this past year, or this past, you know, maybe five years ago. Uh, she asked me to come and introduce her as the coach at Fresno State, and that was probably the biggest honor I've ever had in my life, really, to get to introduce her and, you know, have something like that named after her. It was just phenomenal. But, you know, she, she was the best, and it's, I, I just was honored, you know, that I got a chance to know her on a personal level. I heard she was total glamour. Like, her total hair glamour, was yes. fixed perfectly. She's out in Always. the circle, and I met her in 1976 in yes. Stratford at the National Championship. Okay. And I really didn't know who she was, but Mar Dricker oh, yes. introduced me yeah, to her, absolutely. had a ball signed by her, and said, Dot, one day you're going to appreciate this. And yeah, I'm telling you, I have coveted that ball um, for a long time. Yeah, she was, you know, really one of the best and so feisty, so competitive that even, you know, I know she passed away last year, but even up until then, she would come to our games and she'd be so feisty and so competitive. It was just great, you know, to get to know someone like that who – you know, I couldn't even carry her ball bag for her, you know, because she was so good. But she was phenomenal. Now, you pitched. 
I did. I pitched. Not like her, but I did pitch and, um, you know, for a long time, even into my 40s, and didn't want to give it up, you know, until 96 when, when I went with the Olympic team, I had to stop, you know, because we did the tour and all that. And after you're in your 40s, it's hard to come back, so I had to stop. But I, I did it up until the minute I could still, you know, run on the field. 1996, Olympic coach, okay, <laughs> legend. Here we go. We'll talk about that later. Okay. All right, anyone else? What about uh, Sis King? Do you remember her? I don't really remember her, but the lady next to her, Gloria May, was, again, from Fre the Fresno Rockets. Oh, my gosh. What is it about Fresno? Well, you know, in the 50s, they were one of the top teams. They won three national championships, and she is one of our – top boosters, still goes to the games, even though I'm not there. She was there when, when uh, they named the stadium after me last, uh, two years ago, and phenomenal. Flies herself to the games. She's a pilot. Oh, my God. Yeah. Stadium named after her, Margie Wright. Legend. Okay. Anyone else? Talk to me. Okay, let's We're see. We're walking around the hall. Well, let's look on this one. Oh, wait, right here. Carol Spanks. Oh, Carol Spanks. Carol Spanks, other than you, probably one of the best short subs I've ever seen. Political correctness. No, I'm serious. I mean, one of the best I've ever seen. And, you know, unfortunately, she doesn't, you know, coach anymore, but she's also one of the best coaches. And, you know, one of our, my biggest competitors when I first went to Fresno and just a phenomenal athlete, loved the game, probably could still outplay some of us, you know, today. And right over here is Joan Joyce, who, in my opinion, clearly was the best pitcher ever in, in the history of softball and was very unorthodox, uh, unorthodox because she threw the slingshot and she was phenomenal. I mean, that ball got by you, um, you know, so quickly that if you fouled it off, you were lucky, you know, that you were able to do that. Um, so, you know, this wall right here, Mickey Davis, Tremendous um, athlete, outfielder, Diane Callahan, one of the fastest players ever in our sport. Left-handed, wasn't she? Left-handed. She played shortstop in 1975. Yes. At the national championship, and I saw a left-handed shortstop. Santa Clara. I was yep. like, what? Yeah, she was phenomenal. And you couldn't get her out. If she got the ball in play, you couldn't get her out. And, of course, Donna Lopiano, one of, not only one of the best athletes ever, but, you know, for women in, in athletics, she fought very hard for them in many ways. Started the Women's Sports Foundation, um, was the executive director for years, and, you know, just a phenomenal history. You know, just on this wall right here, you know, Nancy Ito caught oh, right. both Donna Lopiano and Joan Joyce, you know, when they both played for Orange. And, I mean, they're just, it's just the history of this sport. I wish so much that these teams that are playing in the World Series right now would have had the chance to watch these women play because there was nobody better, really. I mean, they, they loved the game and they played for the love of the game. They weren't ever worried about getting scholarships because they weren't invented then and there were no sports other than in the summer for women. So they, they played because they loved it and they sacrificed so many things in their lives, you know, to be the best that they could be. And, you know, it's so wonderful they get this recognition here in the Hall of Fame. You know, talk right now is parody in the sport throughout the country. But there's a lot of players here, as you mentioned, from California. Oh, yeah. What was the difference in California versus the rest of the country? Well, I think at the time in California, um, you could play year-round, although I think a lot, of the, a lot of the women that are on these walls in here played other sports, um, you know, along with softball. They played... A lot of them played basketball, you know, in the winter, and they played on organized teams, you know, like AAU basketball, and then they played softball in the summer. One of the reasons, in my opinion, that all of these women played for such a long time was because they didn't focus, you know, just on one thing. They, mm -hmm. they were athletic, and, and even though they lived in California, they played softball in the summer. That was it. They didn't play all year. They played in the summer, and... You know, some of these players played in, until their late 30s, early 40s, and, that, and those were some of their best years. Well, even as when I went to college, yeah. which is the, you know, early 80s, right. I couldn't wait to play summer ball. I mean, it was like, okay, I have a scholarship to right. play softball in college, but really it's summer where it's, it's all at. Well, and it's still summer is where everything is, and the whole recruiting process is it takes place in summer, you know, with all the ASA teams and, you know, the... PGF and all these other organizations, that's where these kids get recruited from. And but women's major, I mean, well, women's major was it. Women's major turned in 
to the uh, first professional softball league in the late 70s. And then once that league folded, women's major was, it was the way to go. Yeah. And then, you know, in 96, when you could make the Olympic team, it all came from women's majors. It didn't come from the age groups. In fact, it was much better when there weren't age groups, honestly, because people like you and I got to play with the legends and against some of the best players ever mm -hmm. in our sport. And I don't know about you, but for me, it made me a better player. Mm -hmm. I failed a lot, but I didn't realize it was failure. I just thought, that's all right, I'll get her tomorrow. You know, I didn't, yeah. I didn't think of it as a bad thing because I was so much younger and I followed their lead. And, you know, they were great leaders. And, I, you know, I just, I wouldn't trade my years, you know, for anything. Mm -hmm. Well. A lot of people think it's documented I'm the youngest player ever to play women's majors at 13. But Margie Wright has told me that she actually fudged a little bit on her, na on her age, saying she was 14 when she really was 12. Well, actually, I said I was 12 when I was 10. <laughs> oh. Because 12 was Even the, better. Yeah, 12 was the age. And um, so I, my dad started our team because I, got, I didn't get to make the boys little league team like you mm -hmm. and so he started a, a girls team and you had to be 12 in ASA to play and I was 10 so I lied about my age so I could play with my sisters and you know and my dad and never looked back <laughs> <laughs> legend in the game all right let's keep moving over here quickly what do you see that sticks out you know to you Sharon Backus now, Sharon Backus not only was she a great a great athlete and a great player um, you know, I had the fortunate opportunity to get to coach against her when she was at UCLA and I, and I was at Fresno State. Unfortunately, we were runner-up to them three years in a row. Um, you know, they were one of the first teams that ever did a three-peat. In fact, I think they're the only team and unfortunately it was three-peat against us, you know, but she was a tremendous coach, um, a great athlete. And again, you know, when you get to coach against people like that, um, you learn so much about the game and you just learn so much about who you are and and she was a great rival You know to compete against him when we built the stadium in Fresno it was the first stadium on a college campus at Fresno State I asked Sharon if she would come up and play us because that was a big rivalry You know then and she agreed and I mean and that was the best thing we ever could have done We had 6,000 people for the game. It was it was tremendous and um, it's people like that that kept, you know, promoting the sport and moving it forward. Mm -hmm. Hey, I remember 1982, the yeah. first NCAA championship it's offered in our sport, yeah. uh, UCLA versus Fresno, yeah. Wendy Ward in the pitching yes, circle absolutely. for you. absolutely. Yeah. Wendy, up. Uh, yeah, Lorraine remember? Ramsey. Ramsey. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, Lorraine Ramsey played for the Peak and Lats in Illinois, and that was... That was the team everybody wanted to play on, you know, because they were the best. Um, we were the first team. The team I played on in Moline, Illinois, was the first team in the state of Illinois to beat them in like 25 years. She was the pitcher. She was phenomenal. Slingshot, kind uh, of a weird, weird figure eight, right? Weird, figure yes, eight. Weird, weird, very weird pitch. But um, she was, yeah, she was tremendous. And I also got to play for her in the pro league. She was our assistant coach for the St. Louis Hummers and one of the best people I know. I mean, so competitive. She has, a, 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 her mind is phenomenal about the game and her memory, like if you had in, her in here right now, she probably knows everybody on these walls. And because her memory is so good, she could remember games that, you know, I had already forgotten and just an outstanding athlete, you know, in her own right. Rosie Adams sounds familiar to me. Well, Rosie Adams, um, actually, my first uh, time of knowing her was when she played basketball in college for Billy Moore, who is also on this wall somewhere. She was a basketball player at Cal State Fullerton when I was in college, and we played them in the national championship when I was a senior in college. And uh, but Rosie played second base, one of the best second basemen I'd ever seen for the Orange Lionettes and was a tremendous player. Also played one year in the pro league and um, very tough to get out. You couldn't get her out. And as a pitcher, you know, it used to drive me crazy. I couldn't get her out, you know, because she was so good. And was there was slapping back then? No, and she was a right handed hitter, mm -hmm. but she was fast enough that she could be infield mm -hmm. grounders out. Yeah. Did they bunt on the knob of the bat? No, I no, saw nobody could do that. Well, yeah, they might have, but I, I, not against us. I don't uh -huh. remember anybody doing that. Look at Rosie. At 14, Rosie Adams was the youngest player to play in ASA Women's Major Fast Pitch National Championship. Yeah. That's how, like, 
history just keeps evolving because yeah, no I was 13, yeah. 1975. Yeah. And then yeah. you, you know, we talk about the ages. Yeah, well, I didn't play in the national championship when I was 10, so. <laughs> <laughs> I did at 13. Maybe yeah, that's what. Yeah. Well, Kathy Aronson, look at, well, she's Kathy sneaking Aronson, down here a little bit. Yeah, Kathy Aronson, again, one of the greatest pitchers ever, you know, in our sport and um, a great coach. You know, I, I played against her in my 40s and she was you know still young well not young in her career but she was in her prime and um you know my claim to fame was i hit a double off of her <laughs> when i was like nice 36. that's when you know you're a legend when someone remembers they hit a double off you <laughs> right that was the only hit i had i think ever off of her <laughs> and i it took me until 36 to do it but i got one so <laughs> now on this side of the wall i mean i have to stop here because the one and only Laura Berg is here, and you coached her at Fresno. What are your thoughts when you see her in the Hall of Fame? Laura Berg is and will always be the best outfielder I've ever seen. I, I mean, a lot of there are a lot of great outfielders, and a lot of great outfielders get compared to Laura. But, you know, I've never seen anybody play the game like she you know, played the game. She loved the game. She was, it was, she was like a caged animal in the outfield, just having to move all the time. Very, very aware of everything around her and just phenomenal. And up to bat, she was a triple threat. She could put a drag bunt down, she could hit it over the fence, and she could slap better than anybody I know. And I, I can't even tell you how honored I was to get to coach her at Fresno State because she was, she made the difference in us winning a national championship. She was that good. And her leadership on our team was so tremendous. And she had a twin sister that played for me too, Randy Berg, and she oh, was Randy, pretty good herself. She was pretty good. Yeah. And then right under her, arguably to me, right up there with Joan Joyce as far as one of the best pitchers ever, Lisa Fernandez. I, you know, the competitiveness in her and the spirit that she had on the mound. Um, I, I hated playing against her at UCLA, but I loved getting a chance to coach her with the Olympic team and with the world team because if you needed something done, that was a person that got it done, always. Mm -hmm. You know, right next to you, actually. I mean, there were... There I couldn't were, pitch. Well, no, but there are a few people that I can honestly say <clears throat> make that much of a difference in the outcome of a game, you know, as far as winning or losing, um, not only for their colleges and for their summer teams, but for their country. And I'd have to say Laura, Lisa, and you were probably the three that really stick out in my mind that have such an impact and, and made the difference in so many of the games that we played over the years that, um, I, again, I, I, it was an honor to be a part of that and to, you know, get to know you guys and, and to get to work with you. It was just an honor. And us to know you. Oh. Um, Lori, Lori Harrigan, but I have to point out with Lori Berg just for memories in the sport. She is currently the only four-time Olympian Absolutely. for the, in the United States of America. Yep. Yep. Um, now we're on the verge of finding out whether softball will get back in the Olympics. I believe the date is July 16th mm -hmm. this year of 2016, where the Olympic committee will vote. That's the international Olympic committee will vote whether softball and or baseball and others will be in the Olympics for 2020 in Tokyo, Japan, and beyond. Yeah. So keep let's- Keep your fingers crossed. Yes, <laughs> keep those prayers going. We want to get back in. Yeah. But Lori Harrigan, I know these are all players that you have coached on the USA team. Yes, yeah, and Lori, and played against, mm -hmm. coached against. She played mm -hmm. at UNLV that was in our conference. And we had a 21 inning game one time with, her. she was against, uh, Terry Carpenter was our pitcher at the time at Fresno. And, I think we ended up winning the game, but what, what a what a tremendous you know talent, and uh, you know in the '96 Olympics and then on the world team, I, I loved working with Lori because she was a lefty, you know, just like Michelle Smith, you know, they were left-handed. They and Michelle Granger, they brought so much more to the game then, and as you'll see now in the World Series, all these left-handed pitchers, where did they all come from? Yeah. You know, but I think they kind of led the way for for young players, you know, to try to emulate them and and to realize there is a spot for them on the field. And at the bottom here, which obviously is one of the top players ever, yes. you know, you have Stacy Newman. Stacy Newman, and again, my competitor at UCLA, but, you know, what a, what a tremendous talent. I got to coach her on the 95 um, Junior World Team oh, in wow. Normal, mm -hmm. Illinois, and they, the USA had not won the Junior World Championship uh, the last two times, so the pressure was on, you know, all of us to win that. 
Stacy became our DP because we had another really good catcher, Kelly Wigginton, that played at yeah. Stanford. Mm -hmm. Stacy became our DP, and boy, what a difference. We won that gold medal. It was almost easy. You know, with the talent that we had, we had some of the greatest pitchers ever. And with her on that team that stabilized our offense, tremendous. Great leader, wonderful young woman. And I, you know, I, I loved her. I recruited her. I wanted her on our team, you know, but she, she's, she had a great career. Let's see as we move over here. Let me see. Oh, Leah O'Brien Leah Amico. Yeah. Brasney. Yeah. I mean, Allison. Yeah. Well, again, you're getting into the players that probably could still play, you know, right now and, and really be a challenge to some of these college players out there today. I mean, Leah uh, Miko, I had her at the sports festivals when we used to have those, you know, years ago. And, um, boy, she was, I needed, we, we, I only have one pitcher. So I'm looking around, and I'm like, who else could pitch? And Leah could pitch. She could do it all. She, play, she pitched. She played first base. She played the outfield. She played three different positions for mm -hmm. us. Uh, we won the silver medal that year, but what a talent. And, again, played at, at uh, Arizona and a big competitor against us. And another, another player that was really hard to get out, you know, because mm -hmm. she was so talented and had so many tools. Susie Brasney, I mean, I think she might still be playing, honestly, because <laughs> she played a long time. She played on the USA teams. She, um, I, I, you know, she was a player that if you needed leadership, her ability was tremendous, but I think her leadership was even better, you know, than that, and her ability to pull the most out of other kids on the team. And, you know, what a great talent. And, again, very deserving. All these people are very deserving to be up on these. And uh, Pomona, right? She played, she well, she played at Cal, Cal Poly, Poly Pomona. Pomona. Yeah. And it's interesting how we now walk through this, you know, hall of fame here. And you're starting to talk more about Fresno State mm -hmm. and college, yeah. which a lot of these women on the other wall didn't really get that opportunity. That's exactly right. In fact, I went to college just to play sports because there weren't any opportunities for me until college at that time, but it was before Title IX. And so I played three sports in college with no scholarships, as all of these older women could do, and they would have been able to do. Uh, but, I, you know, I, here's a point I want to make about that, though. I think our sport has really kind of gotten skewed away from why we play. And to me, the scholarships are wonderful and very deserving. But the focus should be more about loving to play the game and, you know, the interest and the commitment and the sacrifices that you make to get there. Um, I think sometimes scholarships kind of skews everybody's thought process, mm -hmm. and which is unfortunate. And, and I say that because I went through the recruiting process for 33 years as a college coach. And, you know, I was always looking for the kids that love the game. You know, like Laura Berg was easy to pick out, mm -hmm. you know, for me and, and her Randy. sister yeah. and her sister mm -hmm. because they loved the game and you could see it on their face and you could see it in their play. And there's so many of these talented college players today that – really have not met their, their, I think, their potential because maybe they've looked at it the wrong way and they haven't really looked at it as I love playing softball. It's more about who's, you know, who's watching. I hope I get a scholarship and all that. And it's, it's really kind of diluted, I think, the talent pool to make it more equal. You know, you don't see the kids that are just rising to the top because they love it. They love to play so much, like you did, you know, like Laura, like Lisa. You know, kids that would go out and sacrifice their own Saturday afternoon to throw a ball up against a wall and let it come back to them because there was no team, you know, mm -hmm. to play on. You just don't see that anymore. And every one of these women on these walls in here, I know did that because yes. I did, and, and that's all we had. I was so blessed as a Batgirl for the Rebels to be able to see the elite Absolutely. play. And my whole thing, just like you said, is there's a passion. You saw that just the sense of just feeling alive doing it is a lot different than like, I get to go play. It's like, yes. no, I am living as I'm playing. Yes. It's pretty cool. <laughs> well, let's close out here. Does anybody okay. here that, you know, you talked about Michelle Smith, yeah. you got oh, yours yeah. truly up oh. there. Um, well, let's I see. Talk, well, I can talk about these two right here, really, Michelle and you. Well, Michelle, you know, again, we played against her in college. She was at Oklahoma State. And, um, in fact, we beat her in her final game as a college oh, player, no. mm -hmm. unfortunately. But getting to coach her was really, you know, phenomenal because she has a different 
outlook, you know, maybe than some some players do. She has a pitcher's outlook, and you know, of course, I identify with that pretty well. But she's just so competitive. But she analyzes the game. She really understands it, and I guess that's why she's a commentator now. But you know, she tremendous player, tremendous hitter as well. And then Dottie, I, I don't even know if there's enough words to talk about you seriously, um, because I had the pleasure of coaching you, and then I also had the pleasure of coaching a team without you, you know, in that uniform. And that was tough because you were so much the heart and soul of USA softball for so many years. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, when you weren't there, you were sorely missed. You know, we could mm -hmm. tell that you weren't there. And that was tough, you know. That it was, uh, it was really interesting to get back on the team. Oh, wow. And when I was asked to play second base, you know, I told, <laughs> You know, Sheila, yes. <laughs> who's here. Next, yeah, she's yeah. next. Sheila's over here. Yeah. Um, and Lisa and Laura, I said, I'm just not helping the team because I'm playing a position I'm not, right. it's not natural. Right. And they say, you're going to be the best second baseman you can be. Yes. I don't care what you say. You're going to do it because we need you. Yeah. And it was really nice because I think, um, you know, it's great, obviously, to feel appreciated, but yeah. more so to feel what is a team really about? Right. You know, right. is who can how can you bring players together that have that passion yeah because when it comes to it as you know That's... when you are exhausted and the demands are so yeah. high and the expectations yeah. it's that passion and that's, heart that's what drives it's going to bring you absolutely absolutely you talked about sheila yeah well sheila cornell sheila dowdy um I, one of the best hitters i've ever seen i don't know that i've ever seen anybody you know that was was so powerful and studied the game. I mean, I remember Study, watching her yeah. go out and hit off of a tee for hours into a screen by herself because she had trouble with the outside pitch. And, um, you know, she's the one player. I don't. I never got hit much on comebackers. That player knocked my feet out from under me, <laughs> hit me in the knee oh, no. on a line drive. And at about, I mean, I just, I didn't even know what hit me. But a tremendous athlete. Again, that passion and that leadership, you know, Sheila had that and had a lot of it. And then, you know, right below her, I see Michelle Granger, who, again, one of the best pitchers ever in our sport and a lefty. And gosh, she we had, we had three ball. lefties on it. She could yeah. throw 70 miles an hour as a high school, you know, kid. And just, you know, fun kid to coach, fun to play against. Um, you know, she played at Cal Berkeley, and that was our arch rival at Fresno State. She mm -hmm. was a trailblazer, really, oh, to absolutely. go to Berkeley. Absolutely. To go to Berkeley at the time, Fresno State was up there, yep. Fullerton, UCLA. Yep. I mean, Arizona, and she went to Cal. She went to Cal yeah. Berkeley. And yeah. I, I think when you look at, you know, whether it's Monica Abbott going to Tennessee, yes. and they yeah. talk about that. You know, she really uh, is an intellect, and I, you know, yeah. I think that's where well, and she I, wanted to set the tone yep. with parody right I yeah mean. and I think she also liked sitting on the streets of Berkeley yeah. eating ice cream you, you know she she was her own individual and you know that that was why I think she was so successful and uh, but again a great a great teammate you know to have yeah. on the team yeah. yeah I love it let's see anybody else over here Susie Gall oh Susie oh Gall. my gosh what, yeah Susie Gall you know I always looked at Susie as being like one of those unsung heroes that, you know, doesn't, doesn't, she's not flashy. She doesn't, you know, hang out in the limelight very much. But if you have a runner on second, that's who you went up to bat. Yep. Susie would come through nine times out of 10 and quiet leadership. She led by example and was just, to me, I think one of the most low keyed, but yet most overlooked players I've ever seen totally belongs in her, you know, with the, all the other greats. But, you know, a lot of people didn't really know her because she was just so quiet and she played with other great players. You know, she just blended in yeah. because she was so, um, so phenomenal. I think of a servant heart. She even became that's a fireman, amazing. right? A yeah, firewoman. So yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Did. Well, yeah. why don't we have a little bit of one on one time and sort of walk good. and let's sit down and talk great. some softball. Yeah, I'm getting old. Let's sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need a softball bat? Do you want to save $30? Softballjunk.com is offering an additional $30 discount off the price of all non-sale softball bats on their website. That's right, $30. So the next time you buy a bat, go to softballjunk.com and enter the code FPTV30 during checkout. And wham! You just put a cool $30 in your pocket. Welcome back. Now I hope you enjoyed today's show and make sure to come back and watch more episodes of Softball History. Please. 
tell your friends about the Fast Pitch TV show and this series of softball history shows. Make sure to take a look at my website, fastpitch.tv, to keep up with all the episodes of all the shows I produce. Until next time, this is Gary Leland saying goodbye and thanks for watching. This show is a member of the Fast Pitch TV Network. See all of our shows and blogs at www.fastpitch.tv.